fun adventure and they're awesome. And he also refuses to be on camera. So oh, okay. he'll just be a voice. He'll just be a mysterious voice. But uh, yeah, hey, Jake Solomon. Hey. Thanks, for, thanks for agreeing to do this. Can you close that door? It's super loud out there. And I'm Fuck John, me. by the way. Oh, yeah. Hi. So, so this is John Swissum. <laughs> So I've done, he, I watched, yeah, I watched the design. Dude. Oh my God! You sat through that whole hour? Yeah, I'm really bought into the whole Swiss Elm clan now. Mar intermarried with Schaefer's and <laughs> it was kind of it was very Games of Throny actually. I was kind yeah. of waiting to see what happened. Wa yeah, watch for next episode. Oh my God! It's the the blue wedding. We'll see what happens there. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, hey, Jake, thanks for doing this and. Um, yeah. yeah, I so the XCOM reboot, like, that's a an I don't know, unenviable and enviable task at the same time. Like, I I was kind of waiting for somebody to do that, and then uh, I read that Polygon article, which was amazing, and uh, a lot of it sounded fucking brutal. Like, <laughs> the, the development sounded fucking brutal, especially the first time that you did it, and then it was killed. And what? I'm glad you used the word fucking because I wasn't sure what kind of language I could use on this. Okay, good. I'm not very comfortable if I can't curse. We'll so, probably okay, leave it out. We'll probably leave it out, but I I have been known to use curse words as well, so good. I think it's fine. I'm much more comfortable. I've been holding those in. Fuck good. shit, motherfucker! <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem with that. But, um, it, so it turned out amazing. Like, I mean, I think people should read that article. It's incredible, like lots of amazing details about the, the development of that game and so, just the chronicling of like what the hell it took to take old XCOM, something that is like near and dear to so many gamers' hearts and yes. make something that like would appease them but also like bring in kind of like a new group of like people that could appreciate a turn a hard a pretty hardcore still turn-based strategy game that has permadeath and like unwinnable right. states and like all these things that people demanded. And it's amazing. There are lots of people that I talk to, you know, the people that had loved and played the old one, like myself, they they love it. And then people that are like, yeah, I never played the old one, but this game's fucking amazing. And like that, that is, that, I don't know, just excellent job, sir, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like, like, um, it's just, it's just fantastic. And it sounds like you, you yourself lost about three or four years off of your life by, uh, by making this game, and I just want to say thanks. It's awesome. I did it good. I'm glad my 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 soul and my life is is entertainment for you. No, <laughs> um, no. I mean, I mean, you guys know. I'm I'm you know. It's really you know. I always have to be make sure people realize that not only did I lose three or four years of my life, but pretty much everybody on my team also lost another three or four years, and and they're the ones who really are the ones who are. I get to be the guy out in front, you know, taking a lot of credit. But yeah, it was it was brutal for a lot of people involved. But it, now you're, I mean, you're right. Now that it's you know in the rear view mirror, now it's the enviable position. And actually, before we started on the project, you, you guys are in the. Um, Sid and I always joke about like the uh, the pattern of game development. And at the beginning, it's the uh, right. You're at the unreasonable optimism stage. Yes. It's, Right? I'm and a big fan of both of those things, unreasonableness right. and optimism. Right, and so, and then, then, it, then we go into what we call the valley of despair, when all the things are like mashing together and falling apart, but then at the very end you go, oh, I know what we should have done, and then you shift the game. So it's, um, but uh, no, I mean, it's, I, I'm so blessed. Having a job making games is I never. I wake up every morning, and I, you know, I, I know like how blessed, how very blessed I am to just have an opportunity to even do this. So it's been, it's been awesome. So I, it's hard for me to even um, complain, even the times when they're hard. You know, making games is it's hard to beat. It hard to yeah, beat. Yeah, it. it's better than uh, a lot of things that you can be doing with your life to it's, make money yes, that's and right. put put food into your mouth. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's better than a sharp stick in the eye for sure. Um, yeah, so I like, so I, I saw like on Twitter. I mean, maybe it's because because of Dan or whatever. But like, we announced the Kickstarter, and like XCOM is a huge influential game for the massive Chalice concept. And then I saw some tweets from Firaxis guys, including yourself, and I just thought that it. I mean, it was just amazing to like, you know, these these people in this studio that I respect a lot 
just sort of like being excited about the concept, especially also you lived, you know, you, you've been living and breathing turn-based strategy games forever. Yeah. And so to see an, a like really excited, like enthusiastic reaction out of people that, you know, do it all the time and are like so used to it or sick of it or just, you know, drenched in it, it's, it was awesome. And so like, I just want to know like, what was your, what was sort of like your first take on like the massive chalice concept? Like what, I can, mean, can I, you just I, give yeah, me your I mean, thoughts about that? We would, I mean, we are, we are very weird, I suppose, in the sense that, you know, I, I'm sure that uh, other developers, they wake up and they're like, yeah, I'm going to make a, you know, super photorealistic set and that stuff's awesome. And I love playing those games, but we are the guys and girls who wake up and we're like, yeah, turn-based, motherfucking yeah. You know, like we get excited about turn-based and so, <laughs> and, um, so yeah, turn-based and strategy, and when I heard permadeath, I was very excited because, I, I mean, for me, I, I want to see what other people can do, just, you know, just, you know, as a player, as a developer, I want to see what other talented people can do with the concept of strategy games and tactics games and permadeath, like, you know, there's it's a big, wide world, so I'm sort of excited to see what other talented people can do with those concepts. Uh, and there's a little bit of vindictiveness there because you know I'd like to see I'd like to see you suffer as we have suffered. Um, but no, I, I'm I, those are the kind of games we wouldn't make these kind of games if we didn't love them, right? So we yeah. like we're excited to see other like talented, well-known studios sort of like picking up the banner, and you know who knows in in 20 years people may be like, oh, remember when they used to make shooters? Because <laughs> oh god! Not another turn-based strategy tactics <laughs> permadeath game. You know? That is a hilarious future. I think. Like, yeah, I don't know if that's going to be the case. But or maybe we'll that would get. Be awesome. Maybe we'll get to the uh, the crossover XCOM X Massive Chalice someday. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah, we'll have a little crossover. Everyone will be like complaining about like uh, turn-based bros who are kind of ruining gaming. <laughs> Dude, yeah, turn -based yeah. Board right here. That's we're just, right. Yeah. We're just making the. Just making That's right. We've got like four collars. I'm gonna put this down know. immediately before something bad happens. Um, okay, sweet. So, so the like the big. So I love the structure of XCOM. Like, and we talk about this a lot. Like the the fact that you have a real time reactionary strategic layer where right. you know random events pop up and stuff like that, and that's amazing. And then the the turn based tactical layer. So the, one of the things I love about it is that you've got like the very, very low level human scale tactical battles and then the very, very high level strategic layer. Like I feel like a lot of uh, strategy games sort of like live in the middle or somewhere in the middle, but XCOM is like the two really polar opposite ends and then right. they are connected in such an amazing way. Like I love the way that they both influence each other and it That's gives you right. that like, you know, one more turn, one more battle kind of like overall structure. Uh, yeah. so, that's that's exactly right, and that's the um the and you know obviously the credit for this goes to to Julian Galt, the original XCOM, but yes. it's the first or one of the only strategy games that um that has that you have this. What makes strategy games great is that feeling of epicness, right? You feel like you're doing something epic. You know, you're not you're not focusing in on the emotions of, of one character or learning one story. Instead, strategy games reward you with this feeling of epicness. You're saving the world, or you're saving the galaxy, or you're saving the country, whatever it is, huge. Um, but oftentimes that comes with a uh, sort of coldness to it. You know, sure. it has this yep. abstraction, you know, where it's like, okay, well, these are numbers I'm moving around, and in my head I'm trying to force emotion on this. Um, but XCOM then adds the intimacy. So it has both the epic and the intimate because it's like okay now it's these soldiers and you're there for every bullet that's fired every step that's taken you're with there like every every shot against the enemy you've actually done yourself and so you combine this big feeling of epic planet stuff with uh, with the intimate nature of, of what the soldiers are doing moment to moment and that's the kind of thing that and again massive child sounds like it's going to have this as well as like you have this combination you, you get the reward of having this epic feeling but you also have it's really really important to have that intimate uh, combat that allows you to really you know it helps the story grow deeper it helps your emotional attachment to the whole overall story because you've got these little intimate interactions yeah awesome so our, our big like you know the twist that we're putting on it is this and I love that you use the ep the word epic like 37 times in that explanation of it yeah. because we talk about the, the epic timeline is the thing that we really want to add to it where 
um, you know, your character's age over the course of, of the epic timeline, and then you'll choose the ones that you want to retire, and then they will have children as the time is flowing, and then those kids will grow up to be uh, the, you know, the, the fighters in your next generation. And a lot right. of it is what you're talking about, like getting emotionally invested in these characters, and then we're hoping, what we're really shooting for is that uh, people will get emotionally invested in the bloodlines as well. Like, yeah. you know, the Solomon, you know, the Solomon bloodline is that they, you know, they like Jake Solomon, the archer, but then like, you know, his... I'm not an archer! <laughs> <laughs> I always try to, 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 to box people into the... Nobody wants to be an archer, that's what I found. Everybody's like, what about a broadsword? Can I get a, oh, yeah, can I get a, can I get a broadsword? I, or like... I go from the with the teeth. I don't know archery, man. He's no, a fighter. He's a fighter. <laughs> so, okay. Jake Solomon, the frontline fighter, you know, the wielding the broadsword or the giant warhammer or something. Um, and you get invested in him, but then it's like, as he gets older, you're like, okay, like, I really want to see another generation of Solomon. So you, like, retire him from the battlefield, and, and then he has children, and then, uh, you know, the sons and daughters of, of Jake Solomon will be, like, the backbone of your, of your force in, you know, 30 years or whatever. Jackie Solomon will take up the mantle. Exactly, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but are there, so one of the cool things about, about taking this idea to the community so early, like doing a Kickstarter when it's still in the, uh, wait, what was the term that you used? I thought it was unreasonable awesome. Unreasonable optimism. The unreasonable optimism phase is that uh, everybody has like their own idea of what is the coolest thing that the game could, you know, the coolest feature the game could have. So I, I realize I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but this whole epic timeline thing and how it impacts like the structure of a game like XCOM, like what, uh, what is the coolest thing that you can think of right now that you would want to see in Massive Chalice? It's sort of like I'm trying to make sure that the epic timeline is like a big uh, pillar where everything points back to it as much as possible. Um, right. And, right. The, and like <laughs> the idea is um, that. Okay. <laughs> So, so I'll keep talking for a minute and let you think, but like like the examples that we've had. Legal guys will talk. We'll consult the <laughs> yeah. No, um, you know, I've I, even I think the great thing about Master Chess is like you hear the idea and and I think you can see that on the forums. But even people who've heard about the game, like it's one of those ideas that you know is because it just spawned, like everybody who hears it, like immediately yes. goes like, yes, it would be really cool. Yes, yes, so, and that's, it's fertile design ground. That's right, very fertile. And the, um, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think being able to memorialize that timeline in some way, if you're going to embrace permadeath, then I think, and you've talked a little about, about the relics, which I'm very excited about. Sure. Um, I think that being able to memorialize that timeline, so whether it's you know you in these in these keeps, or maybe in, if the Immortal King has some some castle or something like that, I'm always picturing like the Game of Thrones, you know, in the in Winterfell, you know, they've got some crypts where yep. rows of just kings sitting on thrones, you know, and they're holding their swords, and some way to uh, memorialize all these heroes who have sacrificed. But even more than that, you have the relic, right, which yep. or each of these heroes have a relic. And so I imagine when they die, they infuse this relic with some essence of themselves. Yep, or, that's, that's exactly the, right? the direction that we're heading, yeah. Oh, damn it, because that was going to be my good idea. So, uh, <laughs> so instead... Instead, but if they could, I mean, it's very poignant to lose these to lose these characters that you've developed race relationships with. So if they die at some point, it would be nice to somehow bring them back to fight alongside you. And maybe you don't. You shouldn't have control over that, you know. Sure, but in your sure. time, your time of greatest need, you know, to have like your forefathers and foremothers spring out to like save their child or their grandson, you know, you know, if you are. You know, if you're in dire circumstances, you know, this relic, like your your ancestors will, you know, appear spectrally on the battlefield to save you or something like that. But, yeah, I mean, it's um, some way to tie, you know, make the sacrifices that you have to endure as a player to make them not sting quite as much because they feed into this relic and they sort of carry on this bloodline. But you also have to emotionally memorialize those, those yeah. characters somehow, you know, and have somewhere where... I, Maybe not somewhere where I can go, but even somewhere that sort of pops up and I can see, you know, this this the bloodline, but also see like, you know, memorials to these um these uh these people that I've I've cared about in the past and That's awesome. Yeah, like I I love the uh in, in New XCOM. I do you guys call it New XCOM? We always call it New XCOM when we refer to it. New XCOM and old XCOM. 
so confusing. Yeah, because <laughs> as you can imagine, as a product plan, you know, as you have like a product plan, like new X comma, how long does that last? And then at what point does you know, like it's very confusing to so. We always call it like uh, the base game or the core, the re yeah, we don't know what we call okay. it. We call yeah. the next one Xbox or uh, XCOM 1. XCOM right? 1, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the next one. Um, but I love in, in new XCOM uh, when you can go to the, um, I forget exactly what it's called, but you can go to the memorial for all of the soldiers that have died and you get right. the bagpipe music and you see the shots that are sort of like poured out and everything. Right. And you see like all the characters and like how many kills they had, what mission they died on and all these things. And like that, that is so awesome. So I think, yeah, just like, like did you get a lot of like feedback from players about that feature in particular? Yeah, so the, um, the, the soldier memorial, yeah, I mean, that was something that, that, uh, is oddly, people find, I'm not sure what, people find it actually almost comforting to go and see the names because it's it's the only way, like XCOM is very light in terms of memorializing former soldiers, but they actually, you know, your former soldiers are almost out, some of them are almost outsized in your minds, like you have these great stories about them, and, and so it's almost comforting to people to go and see that name and see how many missions they went on and and um, yeah, I mean that's something people have responded to. And you know, again, I, I'm playing through the game uh, through New XCOM, whatever you want to call it. Now uh, again, and I'm I still take great. I don't know for some reason I, I always go there and visit, and then I remember I'm like, oh yeah, that guy Disco, who you know was was eaten or beaten to death, whatever it is. I don't know why, but it's and there's some comfort there in just remembering them. So. I think that certainly in a game that's all about you know about the bloodline. I think that's really important. And um, and anyway, I, I I'm excited because I think being able to see like surnames that I remember, like I remember like the the progenitor, the 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 you know the one the the ancestor of that line to see those surnames reappear on the battlefield. That's going to be so awesome. Sweet. Um, okay, so we're you know it's like we want like we also really like the tactical aspect of XCOM. And, and in New XCOM, you had a, uh, you know, a, a very prominent cover, cover based system. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so we're, we're looking into that and we're looking at a lot of uh, fantasy tactical games like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, sure. Fire Emblem, you know, all, all these other games. And it's like, you know, we, we're definitely going to have a strong melee component in the game. Yeah. And I feel like cover doesn't really make sense. But, but I, we also like, we like the structure of the tactical aspect of. Um, of XCOM, where you've got fog of war, it has this sort of like mysterious, like searching for the right. enemies, like where are they on the map, kind of thing. So it's like we want to have like height and line of sight and fog of war. Like those are the three big like things that we want the tactical layer to be built on. But you know, removing cover and adding melee combat. Like, do you have any thoughts on like how you would do that? Like, given through you know, given the process that like. You know, you made a new XCOM, and like the yeah. tactical one has like you know cover is really important, and and all these other things. Like, is there if you remove yeah. that aspect of the game, like is it? Um, yeah, just do you have any ideas uh, about yeah, like I, which yeah. which direction we should like head out in? Yes, I mean I think that the the cover system, what it did was everybody has an intuitive understanding of cover, so they mm -hmm. can say, oh, if I move there, I'll be protected <clears throat> in some way. And what it did, which was really, really valuable, is that it made the decisions very discreet. You know, the player has this tiny five, ten second loop of gameplay, and then they've got a longer loop of gameplay. But in that five, ten seconds, you, you control of, of a soldier, and you say, okay, what am I doing? And that basically comes down to what are my interesting choices here. Sure. You know? And it can't be like, well, let's just move closer to the enemy. Instead, we had cover, which then provided a couple of discrete choices. And the player could go, okay, I can get closer to that alien because this weapon, it's a shotgun, so I need to get closer to be effective. Or I can flank that alien, which gives me a huge damage bonus. So I need to flank the alien, but I can only do it in a couple of places because I have to be behind cover. And so it makes... It makes this seemingly continuous world very, it, it really divides it into these very discrete choices for the player, where the player can look at the map and go, all right, I got two choices. I really only have like two or three choices. That's, you know? that's really awesome because it also lets players um, sort of arrive at that conclusion on their own. 
right. as well, right? Where it's like it's like you as a player when you're new to the game, you're sort of like you know you're taught through the tutorial that like cover is really important, and then while you're playing it, you're like, oh okay. And it I, I like that idea because the um, the grid on New XCOM, uh, similar to old XCOM, is that they're the squares are pretty small. There, right. there are a lot of squares on the the battlefield, and so yeah, like having the cover points. Reduce the fundamentally reduce the number of squares down to a few like interesting decisions is really cool. That's that's very helpful for like you know the the like sprawling right. decision tree that your brain is going through. Like that's I hadn't thought about it that way. That's really right. Cool. And that's the thing is is making sure that you you know like and that's what it is is boiling down this you know overwhelming number of choices you know with to really only a couple and so the player but the player still feels. They're not, they don't feel like they're being led along because there's right. there's all these options and maybe they have longer term strategies, but really they it quickly presents the player with two or three very clear ones and so it doesn't have to be cover so it could be I mean height is another way the player thinks where it's like well if I get a super bonus for going up high then the player's like okay I really only have two or three choices for height either I can take this high spot here or I can make a move that next turn will put me up you know to another high position so. And, you know, and if it's not cover, it does. And, you know, making it be something environmental is pretty valuable. And and you can do it, I, I suppose, through distance-based stuff. Um, either you know, if there's some sort of, if it's melee attacking from a certain side, maybe. Um, yeah, but I, I do think that like basically using environmental choices to then take something that that feels very continuous and open and, and boiling it down to just a couple of discrete, interesting choices for the player. Sure. Sure. That's that's awesome. And it's it's one thing like uh, Fire Emblem actually shows an overlay of where you can be hit damaged from, right? Like there's kind of this damage layer that you can see, and New XCOM doesn't have that. But like you said, the cover system lets you get a feel for that more intuitively. Mm -hmm. I'll right. be safer here, um, and so that's kind of what they. And in Fire Emblem, I feel like that's kind of the re replacement for cover in some ways. Right. You know, it, yeah, it could be, um, and boy, I'm spitballing here, so this is, you know, this could be terrible. But unreasonable yeah. optimism. That's right. Yeah, oh, this yeah, is I it. Forgot where we were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just, it's of course, it's going to be awesome. It's, it's going to be great. Be a great idea. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, if you had, let's say, you've got uh, whatever, uh, barbarian, and, and he's got uh, a melee attack, but melee being, you know, he attacks and it covers three. You know, he has to be three squares away from his target. But it only goes in one of four directions, right? So he's got to position himself in such a way, or maybe ah. it's maybe it's not that straight. Maybe it's it's stronger from one of four directions. So the player can do whatever they want, but they're always angling to get to the like east side of this enemy, or the enemy has a facing that's very strong, and so the barbarian knows. Look, uh, if I could match this up, like I'm always angling for this position, or maybe that position over there. Um, but you know, yeah, somehow getting it to where. These, it's it's melee, but it's still ha it, the environment plays a really strong role for the player. And so then they they it's it's pretty clear what those choices are. But it, you know, I mean, cover was kind of nice because even if you didn't, as you say, like even if you didn't understand the actual underlying system mechanics, you at least understood intuitively. Like you know, people are shooting at me. You know, yeah, get behind something. Go for cover, right? Cover, yeah. cover is good. So. Yeah, and height works like that. So yeah, it's something along those lines. I think to boil it down to some some pretty discrete. Sure, choices. that's a good way. I mean, as we go through and like start thinking about it in terms of of height and range and, and other things, it's like, yeah, I, I like that having that higher level goal of like having it be in service of taking the like choice complexity and boiling it down to the few actually legitimately interesting things that kind of present themselves pretty pretty early into the game like that seems that seems really cool um so i wanted to talk about some like uh like lessons learned stuff from your experience and a lot of this comes directly from like reading that polygon article and uh just you know some of the the more like either mistakes or like like and everybody makes mistakes like we're gonna make a bunch but none in the unreasonable optimism phase. Uh, so, so the procedural levels, like this was something that people love from old XCOM, and we've yeah. heard a lot about it already. Like people really like the fact that like you know the levels are put together dynamically, and no level really feels uh, the same when you when you go through and play the game multiple times. And I know that you guys started down on that road, but then it was like, 
holy shit, we can't do that. Like, there's no way. Like, we gotta, we gotta back off and like just build a ton of levels, eighty some levels or something. I think yeah, I read somewhere. Uh, yeah, we shipped with yeah some some high yeah some high number eighty or eighty plus levels. Yeah. So like, what were I mean? I sort of read a little bit about like you know just the, that it was hard, but what were the things that you ran into that were like were like you know really like made you hit the brakes and be like, okay, we got, we got to just go with this other thing so that, you know, it can look better and just right. ship on time, really. Yeah, I mean, there were some, there were certainly technical concerns because there were so many things we were doing, environmental destruction, all, all these things that, like, then, then when you pile on top of procedural levels, that was just so much to ask of, of the, um, the technical team. Um, but, you know... Even more than that, and certainly artistically, it's more challenging to make something that's procedurally constructed be as um, uh, attractive and well-crafted looking as something that you can spend some time on and sculpt and think about. Mm -hmm. um, but even you know, there were even a, a number of design concerns that that were they were interesting challenges, but we, we just didn't have enough time to to tackle them. But I think that one problem is that procedural, in its own way, it makes every level different. But if you're not careful, it makes every level the same different, right? So sure. every level is different in the same way, where it's like just clumps of shit out there, you know, where it's like, hey, it's the blue tree again, and it's, <laughs> you know, it's the red grass. And, and what happens is that, you know, you have your system. To, to make levels, you have to find this nice balance between like this is dynamic and I feel like I own this experience because no other players had this and this is this feels authentic to me. I mean, the, the greatest thing about you know procedural levels is that you feel like you own that experience completely. Like you feel like sure. this is mine. I'm telling the story. This isn't something that everybody else, you know, I can't go on YouTube and then watch a million videos of people and how do you beat this level? There's no there's no answer to that. This is my story and, and procedural levels support that really strongly. Um, but the problem is that you have to, I think that the best way to think about procedural levels is to do it in big chunks that you can craft and give a little bit of context to. So let's say it's... Um, and I don't know what the levels uh, are going to be like in Massive Chalice, but um, if it's, you know, they're going to be searching a farm or something like that, you know, having that farm with a little bit of yard and providing that context really sinks the player in the space and says, okay, I know where I am now, but oh, I didn't expect to see this, you know, big chasm here. Or Sure. There's, a, there's enough crafting to give the player context but there's not so much that the player says, oh, this again, you know? And finding that balance is, is kind of a tricky tricky balance. At, at, the, at the, the widest open end, you know, procedural just is completely context-free, and that doesn't help either, you know? You need to give the player a framework in which to build their epic stories, you know, and to differentiate. That was the time I was fighting in, uh, you know, on a farm, and this was the time I was fighting in, you know, in, in the temple, whatever it is. Um, so finding a way to give the player enough context to build it in, uh, a, a good enough story for their own mind, but at the same time not, you know, forcing your experience on the player or giving them, you know, something that they can't ever experience again in a new way. I mean, that's really the, the challenge there. And that's why I think chunks and, you know, that can be as small as you want and that can be as large as you want. Finding what the chunks are that you build your level from, like that's a really... That's a really important step. Is how big are those chunks sure, um, sure. where the player doesn't ever feel, um, you know, a you know doesn't ever feel a same equality, but gets enough context to build a story out of. It. The other thing, uh, the the iteration that you guys did on the strategic layer, like that was a big part. Um, I I think I heard you talk about that at PAX, and it was in that Polygon article too about how it was like, you know, I I loved and man, what a great story to be able to tell everyone. Uh, where you're like, yeah, so Sid Meier and I went home on the, over the weekend and we had a prototype competition to see like which one was going to be better. And I believe yours was real time and his was turn based. And you both decided right. that yours was like the superior way to go. I mean, I like I like that decision because it feels more like XCOM and the real time sort of, you know, running the clock feels like that's what that's what that's the um, the foundation that we're starting with is that like you know that that flowing the epic timeline is all real right. it's all real time and like that 
I, I think that it, um, I kind of think that's the only way to go for this epic timeline concept that it has to be running in real time. So like, but it seemed like you guys had just, I don't know, five, eight prototype stabs at, at the strategic layer. So like, and it's funny to me from the outside looking in, I'm like, oh yeah, you're going to make new XCOM. Like, you put a fucking geoscape in it. What are you doing? Like, but I mean, I'm sure it was much different, like on the team when you actually have to do it. But like, I was like, of course it's real time and it's got a geoscape in it. Yeah, that's the right answer. But like, it, I mean, there were there were versions of this that did not have a geoscape in it, right? Like that was, and there were versions that were turn based, which is like, there, yeah, there were versions that were almost that were like, like card based, turn based. They were crazy, crazy. Sure. And it was because, you know, it's, it was that question of, and I think this is me as a designer, and I, I get this all from Sid, working for Sid forever. Um, we're very much into discrete design, right? We, we want to, we're not into simulation design as much, you know, which the original XCOM was much more of a simulation, which right. was awesome, which was awesome. But, like, the cover is a manifestation of the fact that I'm much more of a discrete designer. Like, I want to present the player with, with a couple of interesting choices, not with some simulation that you then have to, you know, eventually you'll discover what the choices are, but you have to really understand the system well. And sure, sure. You know, it's clear how those things interact, and that can be very fun, um, but I think that that also places a real burden on the player to learn a lot. Sure. Um, and so it was, I was struggling because I was like, well, I'm just going to make this treasure layer into, I'm going to make these choices, which I understand from the original XCOM. Like, I've, you know, they were dumb. I could play in my sleep backwards, blindfolded. And so I understand what the choices are. And I was like, well, I'll just boil them down and make them discrete choices. And I'll just uh. put them in front of the player. And so I'll just make it turn based. And it was, it was hubris, is what it was. It was <laughs> because that, that original XCOM, that strategy layer, that is a, that is a, I, I always call it the, the crystal palace where like it's built, it's like a crystal iceberg where it's like sure. you see it from the surface, but beneath the surface, you try to pull on one lever, the whole thing goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you're like, wait a minute, this isn't the game. So yeah, it was, it was this long journey where, and I, you know, whatever, it was a fun journey and I learned a lot, but it's very funny because I started with a recreation of the original XCOM. And I went, for years, I went down all these different paths, and then I came back to this real-time geoscape, and at the end, I learned nothing. No, I'm just kidding. I learned a lot. But um, <laughs> That's interesting yeah. that you talk about the discrete choices, though, because I feel like, and, and maybe it, it does come from like playing a lot of old XCOM, yeah. and that you, boi you, know, you do boil it down. Because, I mean, and maybe it's because I haven't played old XCOM in a really long time, but playing new XCOM, I really did feel like, even though it's real-time, it does a really good job of like presenting you with the discrete choices. Like you can only research one thing at a time, and it's like, well, which one do you want to do? And you kind of read about them, and you're like, this one. And then it's like, well, I've only got 150 credits. Like I could do these three things with that money. What am I going to do? And then you kind of right. make that. You know, again, that's a that's a single discrete choice that you're making, and then you hit go. You know, it's like I like I think that. So if that was your goal, like I think it, you know. Well, well sure. played, sir. Like I think that's. Of course, that was my goal. No, <laughs> um, no I, I mean, we did, we did end up there. You know, we had like the satellites, and we made the, we made the countries discreet, which they weren't. There was, and so we tried as much as possible to make the decisions discreet. So yeah, you're right. Like you had to have a certain number of engineers to build things, or you had to have a certain amount of money, and yeah, you only research one thing at a time. So we tried to make them as discreet as possible. And I, I think that, I think that really helps. I mean, I think that. Simulations are um, my my natural inclination because I'm a systems designer because I you know I'm I'm a programmer as well like I get I get super emotionally drawn to the idea of these ecologies and these systems that'll interact in all these interesting ways but you know I mean it's well it's well documented that you know the designers having a lot of fun and the computers having a lot of fun and the players just staring at the screen going like, what the hell? I don't understand how totally. I have $12 now, you know? And the designers are like, well, it's because there's actually an economy going on. And in, <laughs> and in, and in Netherlands, uh, there was an oil shortage, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that having some big, chunky, moving parts, I think you can sell an ecology, but, you know, I think having bigger, moving parts that still provide the players some pretty discreet choices is pretty important. That's a good, that's a nugget of wisdom right there. I, that's yeah. excellent. There was, uh, so I have a nitpick section on my uh -oh. document here. 
Oh. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, yeah, nitpicks. You know what? This yeah. call is over. <laughs> <laughs> I should have put it up front, damn it. Uh, okay, so so the part uh, the part of New XCOM where uh, the enemies feel like they, like, and you only see this after you play the game a lot, yeah. it feels like the enemies are in packs, discrete packs, hey, discrete packs, uh, and they are kind of, they feel kind of dormant on the map, and there's this sort of like, once you play the game a lot, you realize that like you need to be very careful about exploring the fog of war because you might unlock one of these uh, an extra enemy pack and get more than you can handle on on your team. And I think right. a lot of people they feel like you know the sniper is one of the best uh, classes in the game because of that because it's like he doesn't have to like unveil new fog of war in order to like be an right. effective soldier whereas like the assault guy has to like run up there and you know he has the highest chance of like triggering a new pack of thin men that are going to just right. totally ruin your day. So um comparing that to the old XCOM where you know it is more of a simulation like is there I don't know what my question is other than like I feel like I feel like that part like like it was somewhat disappointing to like a fan of old XCOM yeah. Mainly because it it just had that sort of like once you sort of see behind the curtain, you sort of figure out how to min max it, and it leads to this like Overwatch creep. Be very careful yeah. about how much you yeah. explore, and That's that and that sort of like you know exploring the fog of war in those in those maps in old XCOM is very cool, and you didn't feel like you were being penalized for like you know moving your dudes around as much. I mean, there's still like you don't want to just run them willy nilly into the fog of war, but um. Right. But yeah, it felt like it was a little more punishing, I guess, in New XCOM, and that led to, uh, I would say, maybe an overly cautious kind of play style, being the being yeah. the best. Well, it's, I, even worse than that, it results in the game telling the player that like you should be overly cautious, and right. that's not that's not a fun way to. The best way to play is not the fun way to play. Yes. So instead, what it should have been is that the player should be able to. There, there should have been more risk reward, which is what XCOM's all about is risk reward. You know, even taking shots or you know making tactical choices, it's always about risk and reward. And and because the player has complete control over the experience, it's turn based. They can control every soldier. That the player feels like it's all fair, right? Even if you miss a shot, you're like, ugh, you know, it feels frustrating. Mm -hmm. But you know, when you, the reason permadeath works in in XCOM is because we've given you complete control, right? We've said, hey, look, that was your decision. You know, we gave you all the information we could. You're the one who ran out there. Um, and so the problem is that I think with waking up the pods is that there wasn't enough of a, hey, there's a risk reward to running around the map. Like if you can catch them unawares or right. if you catch them, you've got a super advantage for one turn where you can wipe them out, right? You don't want them to catch you because that's bad for you. But instead, if you, especially the assault soldier, like, you know, instead if it was like, hey, he gets a big advantage when he, uh, we call it popping pods. If, if the assault soldier pops pods, and he like gets this huge advantage because of it. Like tactically, he's super strong for two turns or whatever. Sure, sure. Then, then you'd be much more inclined to to do that. Or or if there was some way to, you know, if there was more of a uh, you know visibility, like you know, in XCOM, you just sort of whenever you see an alien, they see you. And if that wasn't necessarily the case as well, more protection for the player to move around. Then I think that would have been helped. But yeah, I mean, I think that's that's definitely one of those things where. It's a shame because the game basically, the people who, who play on the highest difficulty levels or have played it a bunch of times, they know like Overwatch, 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 like you shouldn't risk because there's no reward right. and that's, okay. that's a problem. There should always be a reward for any risk the players take. What was, so what was the impetus for the pods? Was it like to even out the player's experience and make it more discreet or like what... Um you know, how early in the process did you guys be like, oh yeah, like it really needs to be like this? Because I mean, having them sort of run around in the fog of war like old XCOM, I think leads to like, I mean, it, it leads to a more dynamic experience and that means more highs, but also more lows. Like, and so that's yeah. sort of what I thought about it as I was playing it. I was like, oh yeah, that, that they were probably trying to like remove some of these like really shitty situations in old XCOM where you run around the corner and there's like, Seven mutons just like having a party back there, and you're like, and they're like, what? And you're just, you're just guaranteed to get kind of boned by it. Whereas in yeah. New XCOM, you're like, you know, I, I don't know. I only ever really popped two pods at a time throughout maybe my entire experience, and it, yeah. it, the game had much more of a like 
pop a pod, deal with those three guys, pop another pod, deal with those three guys, kind of, kind yeah. of pacing it's, to it, it. It is much more, and I think that's where it came from, was this idea of evening out the experience. And, that, you know, the cost is, I think the... Um, I think that we we shaved, we definitely shaved off some of the really low lows in the original X column, but at the same time, you cannot do that without shaving off some of the really high highs. Where again, it comes down to I think the player feeling like they own the experience, and it's not being like shared with the developer who's kind of going like, "Well, we know what's best, little man." Sure, but sure. Like, well, um, and and sometimes that's unfortunate because I think that the the really high highs come from you just being like, "What the fuck? Like this is the craziest thing." Like it feels emergent, and that makes it feel authentic. Um, but actually, the pods in uh, New XCOM some of them do roam around the map. Like if you sit there and wait, like they'll run into you. Okay. Um, but but some of them, what we call lurk as well, and they are just kind of evened out. Like the way that they, even the way they sort of patrol on the map is meant to sort of even out the experience a little bit because, and, and part of that too is because of the smaller soldier count. Um, you know, you start with four and you only go up to six. And so, like, everything becomes much more catastrophic than in the original game. Like, soldiers became more important in our XCOM, which makes then, like, this need to balance things out even more important, where you're like, oh, God, like, all it takes is, you know, in the beginning of the game, you lose two soldiers, you're down 50%, like, you're probably going to lose, you know? And it's this, it was very terrifying. Permadeath can be very terrifying, uh, designers. Um, it's this, it's this great mechanic that, that um, it is one of the few mechanics that I think is capable of, of generating uh, real emotion in players. Like, yeah, you know, I instead agree. of like, trying to pull it out of you with some sort of narrative that you're not, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very hard to be invested in narrative. And, but instead, you know, Permadeath, it, it, at the cost of adding some low lows into your play experience, it also adds some really high highs because you know that the odds you're struggling against are real and authentic. And so your successes are authentic. And so you feel these authentic losses, but what that does is it lays this groundwork. It's sort of like, you know, that sort of like fertilizes the soil for you thinking that when you have a success, you're like, well, I know the game doesn't care about me because I've had these bad experiences. Like, so when you have success, it's way more authentic than in other games. And so that's what permanent does for you. But it also, as a designer, completely, completely whacks out your progression tree. It completely whacks out your your ideas of balance because you have to go, oh, God, what if they're at the end of the game and all they have are rookies? You know, like, sure. it has to be viable. Um, so what I would say is that you guys are being very smart about this because you guys have the, the relics, which is yeah. good. Like, you have to put a lot of um, uh, progression into equipment because you can't, you can't be assured of what strength level the actual people are, but you know you can say like you can say the equipment at this point should probably be at this level. So maybe the game's harder, but if you put a lot of progression stuff in the equipment, that kind of helps them, you know. Sure, sure. Yeah, we're hoping that um, the the massive chalice can be a little bit more resilient in the you know third generation ish, you know third, fourth, fifth generation. Uh, aspect of the game, like you know, just sort of like the end game of your of your XCOM experience, where if you were if you were to get a full team wipe of your like six colonels that are all in you know the <laughs> Titan armor with all right. the plasma stuff, like I I don't well, know if you're coming back tough. from that. Like whoops, like that's really tough um, because you're gonna have unless you were being really diligent about rotating guys in. You're probably gonna have mostly rookies that take their spot, right. and even though the equipment's sweet, whatever. So, like in Massive Chalice, we're hoping that, like, through the the like bloodline system, that you know the guys that die in permadeath in combat, well, they were gonna die anyway, you know, 20 years right. down the line in the timeline. So, if you were planning ahead, you will have people that are are pretty good to take their place that are growing up now, you know. So it's like I I I, I like to envision it where. A full team wipe in Massive Chalice, you could totally be okay with that because you know you have some kids that are about to grow up and they can like take over the equipment and take over the new relics that you just got from you know losing a bunch of dudes, um, and then they'll be you know they'll be suitably strong enough to like continue the fight. 
and, and because I have a direct line to the massive child's developers right now, <laughs> yeah, I want to look. This is the one thing I've been thinking about because there's the two deaths. There's the battle death, and then there's the old right. age. Death. Yep. But you guys, and what throws me off is you guys talk about the old age death as kind of the good death, but that's not the good death. Like, if you're a warrior, you have to die with a sword in your hand, right? Like, I want there to be, <laughs> so, like, you know, like, the, the warrior should come to you as the king and say, I'm not feeling good, it's time. I've got a runny nose, I'm, I'm 85, like... <laughs> Send me out. I want to go back. Like That's they want, they want to go to the halls of Valhalla, where all of the demons that they have killed in battle will serve them. Right? You know, and the only way to go to Valhalla as a warrior is to die with a sword in your hand. And so I think I'm just saying, just consider the fact that you know, death on the battlefield is like a warrior's like. Desire. They don't want to die in bed. They yeah. want to die. Yeah, yeah, that's no, that's awesome. I could see, I could almost see like different. Um, see the relics that are generated being different if you fall in battle or if you die in your bed. You know, and the the die in your bed ones are more. Um, you know, they're more either like defensive or passive in nature or whatever. But like the ones from the warriors that have died in battle, like those are like your real like offensive, like right. you know whatever kind of things. Like that could be. I'm sure that there's a more interesting split. But just having them be different and having there be a bonus. Oh, we had talked about one thing we didn't talk about was the morale system. And I want to. I don't know if I have questions oh. about it other than it's really great in XCOM. But we had talked a lot about, like, because we have these, um, you know, like in XCOM, all your soldiers are, are just, like, bros, basically. Like, they're just all, they're just all like, battle buddies, you know, and you can craft any sort of fiction you want about them. Uh, right. But, you know, they're just, like, all sort of, like, the same age and the same, you know, train. they're all in their prime and they are for the whole game. Uh, but, you know, in, in, in Massive Chalice, we're going to have, like, you know, fathers and, and sons and, like, daughters and sisters fighting and, like, you know, maybe even like, uh, you know, a grandfather and his granddaughter like fighting side by side. So like, you know, having you are twisting the heartstrings. I like that. That is, that is horrifying. But it's it sounds awesome though, right? And we, yes, we talk a lot about like you know that opening scene in um in of Lord of the Rings, uh, the you know Peter Jackson's uh, awesome movie where like I oh man, I just have blanked on all the character so names. Weird. <laughs> yeah, Isildur, right? Okay, yes. where like he sees his father get killed by Sauron, and the sword right. gets broken, and he picks it up and like cuts his fucking hand off, and the, right. cuts his fingers off, cuts his fingers off, because that's where the ring is. Uh, right. But it's just like this this cool uh, moment, and it obviously it's a very fantasy you know thing, you know, just to think about like the fathers and sons, or you know mothers and daughters fighting alongside each other, and having their. Uh, one one of their deaths on the battlefield greatly impact uh, blood relatives. Yes. So a, a father sees his son die, and that and and that drives him into like a blood berserker rage where he like goes around and he's like super empowered for the rest of that fight and is like you know has just like vengeance coursing through his veins and he's just hacking. You know you're like oh man he's super powered up because he saw this. Or John's John's example is like like a son sees his father die. Or let's say a daughter sees her mother die. Let's be gender inclusive, and uh, and she runs over and can actually equip the relic that's been created on the battlefield right then and there, and actually use that for the rest of the battle. Uh, on top of like taking it into the future, but but you know being able to equip it right away and sort of like get the power of that thing and like keep fighting. And it's like, yeah, I I also like the idea of turning the morale system into a bit more of a positive thing. Rather right. than a negative thing, because um, you got yeah. you got a lot of negatives stacked against you in XCOM, and when your rookies are freaking out, it's like, oh man, it does feel like the game is sort of pouring salt in your wounds at that point. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely the thing with the the, the morale system in XCOM. It's kind of like uh, double damage, right? It's kind of like yeah. you know, it's kind of like double penalty, where it's like uh, they're freaking out because things are going horribly, and also them freaking out is something that's going horribly. So it's it's a horrible yeah it, it can be a double penalty system but thematically it's very strong and every once in a while it'll generate a great moment but I think that having it positive is good but we 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 did a lot we, we definitely thought about going down that road some too and you just have to be careful that people don't it's very hard to keep make a system that people can't game right you know that sure. people don't go that they don't um, like you want to make you want to make sure the emotions are pure. 
and that loss is always like a bit of an emotional tug for them um, and doesn't become, it, it doesn't, you know, doesn't get mixed up in this weird feeling of like, well, you know, sorry, but uh, now, now it's time to do some ass kicking, you know. Um, it's weird because if the, you, it, you know, keeping the emotions of that, that pure where the player can feel that sense of sorrow, I mean, I, you, you could mitigate it. It's interesting. I actually don't know. I mean, maybe it helps to mitigate it with something positive. But, you know, maybe it confuses that, too. I don't know. But I think that it has to be, I think there has to be some positive to it. Um, again, you, died, you guys should definitely have, like, the ancestors before, when somebody dies, the ancestors before should appear, and they should, you know, welcome him to the, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like Anakin Skywalker should appear, you know, and, you know, they, the ghost version of him appears or something. Yeah. I can't wait for this. This game's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um. Do we have, I, I think that I have run run through all of my questions. Do you have anything that uh, has come out of this, John? Uh, uh, Outside what, of a bag of awesomeness? Well, you did mention that you were, you were playing New XCOM again, and I was just wondering, like, were you able to, when the game hit stores, were you able to play it again after this harrowing, really long development cycle? And what's your take on that? How do you feel about it right now? And what's the way you like to play XCOM? Um, so I play, I play classic Iron Man, like that's yes. what I consider to be the, the true, the truest form of, of the game where, where I can't, I can't uh, engage in my base emotions of like reloading safe games, like, you know, sure. when people die, they're dead. Um, and it's been a lot, it's actually been, it's been a lot, it, you know, it, it's very weird. I, I actually can play XCOM and get engrossed in the actual like game and not think about you know, not think about it as a construct you know construct that I was a big part of but instead I just sort of get sucked in and I start playing and I I worry about this soldier and I I'm stressed about you know having enough money to to buy a satellite and at the same time upgrade so you know I get in this groove where you know for hours I'll just be playing a game and it's been it's been very very it's been a nice coda to the whole experience is to come back to it and play it and of course then there are things where I'm like Oy, oof, oof, that's frustrating <laughs> you know you know so I'll be like you know I'll be like oh boy write that down you know like oh, that's irritating why why was that ever a good idea um, so that that's been good too but a, a lot of it's it's been nice it's been a nice coda to see like all the work that everybody on the team didn't experience it as a gamer. I have enough space now where I've forgotten some things. Yeah, and yeah. Just to play it a couple hours long, like you just get this long experience and it's been nice. I mean, I, I, I've been, I legitimately, I've honestly been having a really good time with it. So that's been, that's been kind of nice. It's kind of a nice way to close the book. And, you know. I, have, I have one more question that I just thought about. And that's yeah. awesome, by the way. That is, yeah, that, that is super cool. I don't mean to cut you off, but I did uh -huh. think of one more question. Uh, so in XCOM, there is this whole, um, I don't, I mean, there's a bit of dialogue about it, but it's this, it's this thing where you have to fight fire with fire. You have to use the alien technology in order to defeat the aliens. Their weapons and technology are abjectly better than what you, you have or you're capable of producing. And there, there's even a line in there where I think like Dr. Valen and um, uh, uh, Shen, I don't know if he's a doctor. Is he a doctor? Yes, he's a doctor. He's a, he's doctor. a doctor. And Dr. Shen. And he worked long and hard for that doctor and <laughs> asshole, so don't be trying to take it away from him. <laughs> That's true. He, yeah. Uh, I always love pointing out he's the guy from the Dharma Initiative on Lost, Dr. Shen. Is. Oh, no way. That, that yeah. makes sense. I didn't even notice that. That's yeah. fantastic. Connection. <laughs> Right. So there, there's this conversation where they talk about like, like I think it's right around sci when psionics come into the game, yep. and they talk about how like, oh God, like we're becoming them. You know, is it worth the price in order to defeat them, kind of thing. Um, and I feel like that's a really super interesting kind of thematic thing that's just very, very lightly touched on in XCOM. Right. Um, and I feel like that, so there's that paired with uh, the kind of like pretty linear tech tree. That, that you right. see in XCOM, where it's it, it's not a question of if, it's a question of like when do I research these things. Right. Um, and like I think it totally works for the game, but yep. we're, we're talking about like with this, with the demonic technology, having them be, um, having there be kind of like two sides of the tech tree, two parallel 
things that you can jump between or something like this where the demonic technology actually is more powerful than the human technology, but it comes at a price. It's like very consequence laden. So that you, right. have, you have the choice as the player, like if you want to just research the, um, you know, the human technology, which is more expensive or uh, not as powerful, but it's safer. And then we have the, the demonic technology. And it's weird, I say on the other side, but I kind of think that it's, it's all, it's all got to be mixed right. together. I don't think it should be like your light side playthrough and your dark side playthrough. Right. Mainly because... I, I really, I, we've been envisioning these scenarios where you run the epic timeline on the strategic layer and you get attacked by the demons at a very, very inopportune moment. You had a yeah. couple of heroes pass away, some of them have gotten too old, you have no one who's really in their prime, and now you have two very old, uh, you know, heroes and, and two very young heroes, and like that's, you know, you can't even fill out a full squad of six, five or six or whatever it's gonna be, uh, to go in there and and get the job done. So you have this temptation of like using some of this like you know dark forbidden technology that is being used against you, um, and and also like you know we talk about uh, mechanic mechanical consequences like you know the big demon sword grafted onto a guy's arm you can never unequip it but uh, it cuts his HP in half but it like guarantees critical hits and does twice as much damage as a regular sword something like that like mechanics. Uh, for tactical mechanics, but we also talk about like strategic significance, about like polluting the bloodline, and like if that guy has childrens, they would be childrens. If he has children, Ch if they have, if they have, if that guy's children, children they, yeah. they would be slightly demonic. They would be uh, they would be weaker, or like maybe too much demonic technology makes you sterile, makes a hero sterile, so he just can't have children, and it right. could end the bloodline. Um, so I guess. Again, I don't know if I really have a question other than like this is the direction that we're thinking, and it's right. and it's you know it's it it feels pretty different from the the kind of the way the technology is is handled in XCOM, and I'm wondering if you have any like you know, hey, that's a you know that sounds cool, but don't fucking do that because that's a really <laughs> bad idea, <laughs> you know, like that's like I want, I'm just wondering if there's like any potential pitfalls you can see in that or like um, yeah, it's, I don't know, you know, it's. It's interesting. I think it's it's totally doable. I think design-wise, that's always just so hard because your thematics. So you know, the design being the mix of theme and and mechanics, right? And the theme of something like that is so strong that you would have to overcompensate with your mechanics. Because if you told me like use demon technology, I'd be like yes. And you'd be like, no, 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 there's lots of penalties. I'd be like, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, grafted sword, demon sword, yes, I want that. And I'll, I'll just give it to these people over here. And they, you know, I, I think that the challenge is um, if, you have a, if you have like two different things and one is sort of a, a not cur but a curse for lack of a better word, it comes with known, it comes with known costs. I mean, it'd be kind of interesting if the cost didn't manifest itself until further in the bloodline, where it was like, it's great. Like, it's really, it's a true Faustian deal where it's like, well, here's this great sword. And you look at sure. it and you're like, that's way better than my shit. And then he's like, but remember, there's a cost. And you go, yeah, 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 I know there's a cost, but I'm, I'm in a lot of trouble. I get these old heroes like... Uh, and he's like, okay, but someday I will return it. Whatever it is. But then you don't actually know what the cost is because then it becomes a fun risk-reward thing where it's like sure. then, you know, a little bit later, he's like, I have returned and all your children have three arms. Or, you know, man, that's actually awesome. So that's, yeah. not, a, that's not a curse at all. But, <laughs> but if it was something that manifested itself later in the bloodline, that would be an interesting... That's a, that might be a better way to go. It's certainly simpler to get your head around, right? Where right. it's like, it has, uh, you know, it's just short-term gain, long-term loss. Like, that's right. what you're offering. And the gain is, is the tactical gain is uh, pure. It, right. it, it, it's pure. It's just like, it's just like, this sword does twice as much damage. It always hits for critical, critical strikes. What's up? Right. And you're like, and sweet. There are times when, and there are times when you, you need it. Like, you right. need, you need the ability to say, like, look, I, I I would like to, um, you know, we do something like this in Civ, in, on Civ Red, we did something like this with um, great people, and you'd get a great person, and the idea was that you could either use them up right away, 
um, and gain some super awesome instant power, or you could put them in a city and you'd gain some power over time. Um, and of course, the power over time has to be pretty powerful because those are very unsexy. But but I think that yeah, if if it's if it's a very clear short term benefit, the player may actually it's not. It's not a bad thing. Like you don't want to do a gotcha to the player, right? So it's not sure. a bad thing. It's a legitimate tool for the player to use, but the player knows, like, at some point, the devil comes back and says, "Hey, we made this deal," and the player doesn't feel bad about it because, again, like, like permadeath, if you give the player complete control, the, the player says, "Ah, this is this is a bummer, but I'm the one behind this, not the AI, not the game. Like, I'm the one who did this to this bloodline that I love so much. They're cursed. They're going to die out after three bloodlines." Or or you know they're they're doomed to turn on their on their squad mates at some point. I don't know when. They're actually more powerful, but at some point they're going to turn on me. You know, and but it's some sort of weird, weird. And, and the great thing about demon powers is you could make them bizarre. You know, bizarre, right? Yeah. You know, they don't have to follow any sort of believable rules. But yeah, you know, because I gave this sword to Grig Nolf, the 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 Slayer. You know. His bloodline is polluted, and that'll manifest itself. Oh, you know, maybe this, maybe his daughter. You know, you you, you know, you're always kind of like, well, it maybe it doesn't manifest itself until combat, and you're kind of like, she's great, you know. And then she gets in combat, you're like, oh god, oh no, like she she turns on all her squadrons. I don't know what it is, but but um, maybe it's better if it. I don't think that's right. I think it actually should. At some point on the strategy layer, it, it manifests itself. You know, and you're like, oh, okay, this is the cost. I'm now reaping what I sow with that demon weapon I equipped, you know. Sure. Yeah. That's I I think that's a that sounds pretty solid. That I like that. Thanks. I'm we're using yeah. that. Yeah, that's that's how it is now. We've decided. <laughs> well, that's that's design ideas. That's how it is until tomorrow right. when you know, I wasn't gonna say it. I wasn't gonna say it. But you're totally yeah, right. Yeah. I'm just being that's just me being unreasonably optimistic. Uh, I, I often say that my, my design style is is just like a digital camera. I spew out a thousand shitty ideas, but one of them is pretty good. Just like a digital camera, you're like, yeah, okay. I'm not a good photographer, but one of them is pretty good. <laughs> and that's that's my role of design, you know. Yeah. I that's just awesome. give you all the ideas and most of them awful. One of them yeah. you're kind of we definitely Man, have to I'm, sift through Sift all through right. all the poop that we're getting. Not from you. Yours, is, yours, is, yours is fucking gold, but like a lot of the, you know, all of our ideas and the ideas from the community, like a lot of them are just like really good, but a lot of them are not really good. And it's just like, well, yeah, it's not just, appropriate for this game. I yeah, mean, just that's, that's true. There's they a, they there's just also, don't really fit. Yeah, there's into a thousand this game. games you yeah. can make uh, from some of these ideas, and we've right. got to find Massive Chalice out of that. It's in there. Yep. It's the one that looks like a big cup. That's right. Chisel away the stone. Thank you so much for your time, man. Yeah, this thanks. Awesome. This has been fantastic. I feel like I'm gonna have to watch it again myself to get all of those, all of, all those nuggets, yes. nuggets out of and there. Look, anytime. Look, I'm, I'm excited for this game as a gamer, but also as a designer. I want the, this kind of stuff to flourish. So anything I can do, you guys hit me up. I'm, I'm happy to. To, to share all my mistakes, which is generally, you know, <laughs> that's all my knowledge comes in the form of, oh, don't do that. Oh, no, 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 no. Yes, if you think of anything, that we, you know, or if you watch the, you know, we're going to try to develop the game as much as we can, like, openly on the internet and stuff. So, like, if you follow that and you see us doing something real stupid, just set, you know, feel free to send an email and be like, what the fuck are you guys doing? You need to I'll stop be watching. That. I'll be watching. Okay. And it, when it comes time to, you know, convince GameStop customers that they should, in fact, get on the internet and buy Massive Chalice, we hear you have some experience. That video was amazing! Uh, it's amazing. <laughs> I re we watched that again the other day, and it's really fantastic. Oh, man, yeah, that was, that was, yeah, I'm not doing that again. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, good. No, that was awesome. It actually was kind of awesome. And it, it's actually, it's great to have, like, those humbling moments where, where you know, I was uh, I, I I learned very quickly that everybody knew pretty much two games, pretty much two games out there, and so yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a, it's a, it's such a big games are such a big uh, you don't realize how big they are in terms of you know like there are and that's what's great about massive childs like there there is room at the table for all kinds of games, but I want to see our our 
Our play setting of turn-based tactics, I want to see it bigger. I want <laughs> more too. dinner, right? <laughs> Me too. I don't even yeah. know if this analogy has gone too far. i got to stop right now. <laughs> All right. Okay, awesome. Thanks, right. thanks, Jake. This has been this has been awesome, and I think I think the backers, you know, the people that like we're gonna, Paul's gonna edit this thing and put it up there, and I think they're gonna I think they're gonna eat this up. This is awesome. This is exactly the kind of stuff that I think they wanna they wanna see being talked about and stuff. So glad to help. Yeah, glad to. thanks so much. Right. And we'll awesome. we'll be in touch. Okay, take care, guys. Down the road. Thank you. That was cool. Yeah, that was really awesome.